Travis Knight, all I gotta say is you got the touch! You got the power! Directed by Travis Knight, the man that directed Kubo and the Two Strings. An actual good Transformers movie! Wow, what a shock! All we have to do to get a good one is to get rid of Michael Bay as the director and get the director of Kubo and the Two Strings instead! What a shock! <laughs> Unfortunately, we still have Michael Bay as the producer of this movie, so... There's still some of his cliches in the movie that you would normally see in a terrible Transformers movie, but they are to a minimum and they are bearable this time, where, where in all the movies that he directed, they were right up front and ruined the experience of watching a Transformers movie. Let's talk about this film. So, this movie set in the 1980s. You have the Transformer Bumblebee coming from Cybertron to Earth with the assignment of scouting the planet out for the Autobots to come here in the 1980s to hide out to escape from the Decepticons. But three of the Decepticons have followed him and the three De Decepticons that have followed him according to IMDB are Shatter, the the Decepticon that could transform into a red jet and a, and a red car. Dropkick, a Decepticon that could transform into a helicopter and a blue car. And the first Decepticon that you see on Earth is actually Blitzwing, which is weird because it looks like Starscream if you're somebody who knows the cartoon very well. And Blitzwing is the transformer that could transform into both a jet and a tank. This transformer, you only see this transformer transform into a jet, not a tank. So that's weird that they would call this transformer Blitzwing when he looks more like Starscream than Blitzwing. Whatever. When Bumblebee gets to Earth, of course he scares the humans a bit and... He picks the transformation eventually of a Volkswagen Beetle. He hides out in a garage where Charlie Watson, played by Haley Stainfield, is working as a mechanic. She helps fix the cars up for the guy that runs the garage. And she's been mourning the loss of her father. And when she, her father was alive, she used to like do high diving, but she hasn't done high diving in a while ever since her father died and she pretty much everyone else that she's cared about has moved on in regards to losing her father. Her mother has moved on and found someone new to fall in love with and the brother that she has seems to moved on, but she hasn't. She still is mourning the, the loss of her father. Since she has reached her 18th birthday, she wants a car for her birthday. The guy who runs the garage lets her have the yellow beetle that's, that's there. So she drives it home, not realizing that the yellow beetle is actually Bumblebee. And when she gets the car home, she finds out that Bumblebee is the yellow beetle. They form a friendship and, and she helps Bumblebee against the Decepticons, and that's pretty much our movie. Now, the main reason why I decided to return to the Transformers franchise and watch this movie is because it is being directed by Travis Knight, the man that directed Kubo and the Two Strings. That was the main reason I wanted to see what the difference was going to be between this movie and the terrible Lego Bay films. And the difference is, this is actually a good movie. This movie actually feels like the cartoon. I was so shocked. The first five or ten minutes of this movie 
shows Cybertron and shows the Transformers on Cybertron and the Transformers you see on Cybertron are the ones that actually feel like the cartoon which was so refreshing I love that part of the movie they were great then when Bumblebee gets to Earth and being chased by the Decepticons that part was great Haley Stanfield is really good in this movie. I really did like her in the film. I like the friendship that she forms with Bumblebee. Now, yes, you can find a lot of comparisons between E.T. and the animated film Iron Giant. There are those similarities with the friendship that Haley Stanfield forms with Bumblebee in this movie. But I don't mind those comparisons. That is actually a good direction to go with this kind of movie. There's also a boy in this movie that has a crush on her named Memo, who is really good in the film. I did like him in the movie. John Cena shows up in this movie as an army guy, and he's pretty good at times. Some of the things he says is kind of funny, and some of the things he, some other things he says are not, but he's a pretty good character in the movie. The Decepticons that show up in this movie are pretty good. One that was voiced by Angela Bassett, Shatter is voiced by Angela Bassett. I thought that was pretty cool. And hearing Dylan O'Brien voice Bumblebee for what little time voices Bumblebee, because there is a point, if you've seen the trailer, where Bumblebee loses his voice and he's forced to find another way to communicate. And that part is actually pretty cool once he finds another way to communicate since he loses his voice at one point in the film. But I thought Dylan O'Brien did a great job as the voice of Bumblebee, and then of course you get Peter Cullen, the guy who did the voice of Optimus Prime in the cartoons, doing his voice again in this movie, which is awesome. No one else can do the Optimus Prime voice like Peter Cullen. This movie was so good. You can actually see the Transformers fighting when the action scenes come around, which is great because in the Michael Bay films, you really couldn't see what the Transformers were doing when they were fighting all that well. Another problem with the Michael Bay films that is not in this movie is you can actually tell who are the Autobots and who are the Decepticons in this film, where in the other films you really couldn't tell a lot of times. Sometimes you had to guess or you had to go to IMDb or, or somewhere and you had to figure out who were the Decepticons and who, and who were the Autobots. <laughs> Memo, the guy that has a crush on Charlie, is almost annoying, but really not that much, which is great because I'm glad that there are no annoying characters in this movie. Charlie's brother is almost annoying too, but then later on he does become annoying because he actually begins to help Charlie out, which is awesome. And I just really, really like this movie. Now let's get into the negatives, which are very, very small. Those negatives would be the cliches that you normally see in a Michael Bay movie, which would be sexually objectifying some characters. In, normally in the Michael Bay films, the way they would sexually objectify some of the characters would they would they would normally do that to the female characters, but in this movie they don't do that to the female characters. They switch that up and do that to the male characters in this movie. So two of the male characters in this film. I didn't mind that too much. I mean, it kind of bugs me when it's the female characters because that's very distracting, and it was a little distracting with the male characters, but. It actually worked very well into, into the plot very naturally, so it made that big of a deal and it was only, it only happened like twice, really. Another problem would be when the points where the, the little brother was a little bit annoying, which really wasn't all that much, or the, or the points where Memo was a little bit annoying, but really not all that much. So really this is actually a good movie and, and any flaws to the film are very minor, which is awesome. I really, really like this film. So overall, I definitely recommend this film if you're a Transformers fan and you've been waiting for an actual good Transformers movie. This is finally it. It took six, it took six Transformers movies to finally get it right. <laughs> so I'm going to give this movie a an A-. minus. Yeah, I actually like this movie that much. Definitely check out Bumblebee.
You know, Dr. Evil from Austin Powers would love Aquaman because this movie has sharks with laser beams on them. by James Wan, the man who directed The Conjuring and Conjuring 2, starring Jason Momoa as Arthur Curry, Aquaman, and Amber Heard plays Mira. You have Nicole Kidman in the movie playing Atlantia, Aquaman's mother. Tamara Morrison, who played Django Fett in Attack of the Clones, is playing Mr. Curry, Aquaman's dad. Patrick Wilson plays Aquaman's half-brother Orm. Also known as Ocean Master, uh, Yaha Abdul Bantin plays Black Manta. I'm sorry if I butchered this guy's first name. Dolph Lundgren plays Mira's father in the film. Julie Andrews voices one of the sea creatures in this movie. Randall Park shows up in the film playing a scientist. That's pretty much our cast. The plot of Aquaman is an origin story. We find out that Aquaman's mom, Queen Atlantia, played by Nicole Kidman, left Atlantis because she was arranged to marry an Atlantean that she did not love. She's found in Maine by Mr. Curry, Aquaman's dad, a lighthouse keeper. Mr. Curry and Queen Atlantia, they fall in love. They produce the son, Arthur Curry, a.k.a. Aquaman. But Queen Atlantia feels she has to go back to Atlantis in order to protect Arthur and her husband. She knows that she still has to marry this Atlantean that she doesn't love, and she, she believes that Atlantis could attack Arthur and her husband if she doesn't do this. So she goes back to Atlantis. Atlantis punishes Queen Lantia for leaving. Aquaman grows up resenting Atlantis because they punished his mother. He doesn't care that this is his heritage and he has a right to the throne. He only cares about protecting the surface world, which is where he meets up with the man that is going to become Black Manta. So this movie has two villains, Black Manta and Aquaman's half-brother Orm, a.k.a. Ocean Master, played by Patrick Wilson. And we have seen Aquaman's powers manifest, like his power to talk to fish when he was a child in an aquarium that has sharks. Wait a minute. Aquariums don't have sharks. <laughs> I know this is a movie about a comic book hero that can breathe underwater and can talk to fish, but aquariums do not have sharks. So you're making me suspend my disbelief a bit too much now, <laughs> but I digress. Mira, played by Amber Heard, leaves Atlantis to find Aquaman, played by Jason Momoa. Mira tells Aquaman that your brother Orm wishes to take over Atlantis and attack the surface world. In order to do this, he has to find this armor and Poseidon's trident. This way, he'll have complete control of Atlantis. He'll be king, and you're the only one that can stop him. You have a right to the throne. You can challenge him. Mira convinces Aquaman to come back to Atlantis to stop Orm. And that's pretty much our movie. This, this is the... First time we ever gotten an Aquaman movie, which is a character that I really, really like. Aquaman is one of my favorite characters from the DC world. Now, this character has been considered to be a useless character within the DC universe. He's been considered to be a joke because his two main powers that people know the most are that he can breathe underwater and he can speak to fish. But there's so much more to what Aquaman can do. He is super strong. He has Poseidon's trident. 
and he has other abilities. And speaking to fists can be a pretty awesome power when there are mythological creatures existing in the DC universe. And mythological creatures do show up in this movie, which is very awesome. So the idea that talking to fists and talking to other creatures of the deep, like whales and dolphins and other sea creatures, is considered a, a not so great power, that's stupid. It is actually a very great power to have, as well as being super strong and being able to breathe underwater. And he can swim very fast. And make weapons out of water. Although that's the, that's one power he doesn't show in this movie, but this is a good movie anyway. Now, when I saw Justice League, which I hated, I hate the Justice League movie. I felt that Aquaman was underused in the film. I really felt like they didn't really use Aquaman to his full capability in the film. And I was hoping that Aquaman was going to be used better in his own movie, of course. And this movie is pretty good. It's not as good as I hoped it was going to be, but it is a good movie. Comic book creator Peter David was the main guy responsible for making Aquaman into such an awesome character when he gave the guy a beard and in one of the versions of the comics he actually had an adventure where Aquaman gets his hand cut off and gets it replaced with a, a small spear that can shoot out of his hand, which is very cool. If that happens in the sequel, that would be awesome. <laughs> but let's talk about this movie. Now, when I saw the Justice League movie, I hated it. I hated that movie. That was a terrible movie. And one of the big flaws of that film was the fact that Aquaman was so underused in that movie. So hearing about that we're going to get an Aquaman movie, I thought, great, we're going to see Aquaman in his full glory. And... And Jason Momoa is great as the character. I really do like Jason Momoa as Aquaman. Amber Heard, I thought, did an okay job as Mira, although one of the flaws with this movie is that the chemistry between Jason Momoa and Amber Heard is not there. There is no chemistry between these two. I really didn't feel any romantic chemistry between them, which is such a big disappointment with this movie. The, this is the second romantic couple in the DC world that has no chemistry. Henry Cavill and Amy Adams have no chemistry, and now Jason Moa and Amber Heard. Wonder Woman and Chris Pine seem to be the only two that have chemistry, and Wonder Woman has chemistry with Ben Affleck, so what's up with that? But Amber Heard did do a pretty good job with the water controlling powers, which is great. Nicole Kidman, I thought, was great in the movie, playing Aquaman's mom, Atlantia. She was really good in this film. Then you have Tamara Morrison playing Mr. Curry, Aquaman's dad. I thought he was really good in the film. Dolph Lundgren showing up in this movie. I didn't know he was going to be in this movie. That's great, and He plays... Mira's father, he was very good in the movie. William Defoe plays Aquaman's trainer, his mentor in the movie, which is very cool. Kind of like his Kenobi, if you were to compare him to, to Luke Skywalker, I guess. Randall Park plays a scientist that believes in Atlantis. And Julie Andrews voices one of the sea creatures in the movie, which was really cool. Atlantis looks great in this movie. I really like the way Atlantis looks in the film and that's the price of the movie alone. Patrick Wilson does a really good job playing Orm, Aquaman's half-brother and the main villain of this movie, aka Ocean Master. Uh, Yahaha Adul Mantine plays Black Manta and he really steals the show in this film. I really like the way they did Black Manta and the fact that he looks like the comic book. He, the guy's helmet to look exactly like the comic book, which is awesome. And they got the iconic Ocean Master helmet as well, which is great. As well, they if you've seen a couple of the trailers and the posters, you can see that they got the arms outfit for Aquaman, which is awesome. So, this was a pretty good movie. It did surpass my, my expectations, because my 
expectations were low for this film. DC movies have not been making me happy. I did not like Man of Steel, did not like Batman v Superman, I hate Suicide Squad, I hate Justice League, so Wonder Woman has been the only movie that has really made me happy as a DC fan. So hearing about Aquaman, my expectations were low, and yeah, this movie surpassed those low expectations, but it's still not as good as I hoped it was going to be. So let's talk about the, the flaws of this movie. Now I said already that Amber Heard and Jason Momoa, they have no chemistry in this film. The romantic chemistry between these two is not there. I would like it to be there. Some of the other critics online have said that they did feel some romantic chemistry between them, but I really didn't feel any romantic chemistry between them, honestly. And maybe it's because of Amber Heard herself, I mean, she's not always that good of an actress, really. And I think maybe if they got a different actress to play Mira, there might have been some chemistry between the two characters then. Another problem with this movie is not all the comedy is that funny. There's a piss joke in this movie that comes up in this film. Albert Man says you could have pissed on something, and that joke is not funny, really, that much. Also, the movie is a little bit too long. There's no need for this movie to be over two hours, really. You could have cut the part where they go into the Sahara Desert to look for the place where the forge is Poseidon's trident. And they could have put that somewhere else in the movie, like when they go to Italy or when they go into the Mariana Trench. That would have been a much smarter idea. It would have cut corners much better. Another thing I didn't like is the way they give the motivation for Black Manta in the film, which I'm not going to spoil, but I would have liked it more if, if, if the motivation was by accident, really. If, if it was an accidental thing that happened, rather than something that Aquaman directly does, or doesn't do, I should say. That would have made more sense. It would have still made him look more like a hero. But overall, I did enjoy this movie. This was a pretty good film, so I guess this is the second best film of the DC Cinematic Universe, or the DC Extended Universe, whatever you like to call this. I'm going to give this movie a B. It is worth checking out, and that's all I got to say for Aquaman. Spider-Verse, directed by Bob Perchetti, Peter Ramsey, and written by Phil Lord. This movie is a origin story of the Miles Morales Spider-Man, an Afro-Latino American who becomes Spider-Man. He gets bitten by a radioactive spider and gets the Spider-Man powers. He gets mentored by Peter Parker to learn how to be Spider-Man, and he gets help from other Spider-Man characters, Spider-Gwen, Spider-Man New War, voiced by Nicholas Cage. Spider-Gwen is voiced by Haley Stainfield. You got Spider-Ham, a, a Spider-Pig. <laughs> and Penny Parker, who is an anime version of Spider-Man. She is a, a girl that has Spider-Man powers, but uses a robot to fight crime. And all these Spider-Man characters have to go against the Kingpin and a bunch of other Spider-Man villains. Apparently, the Kingpin has opened a, an interdimensional portal into the multiverse. And that's how all these different Spider-Man characters have gotten into Miles Morales' world. And now they all have to team up against the Kingpin and try to close the portal. And that's pretty much our movie.
Now, I really wanted to see this movie because I wanted to learn about the Miles Morales Spider-Man and of course I'm a Spider-Man fan. I love this movie! This was an excellent movie, probably the best Spider-Man movie I've seen yet. <laughs> Shameik Moore is great as Miles Morales. He's awesome in this film. Jake Johansson is great as Peter Parker. I really did like him in the movie. Haley Stainfield is awesome as Gwen Stacy. The friendship that her and Miles have is really good. They had very good chemistry and Miles had really good chemistry with Peter Parker as well. All the other different Spider-Man characters, like you have Spider-Man Noir, voiced by Nicolas Cage, which is awesome. And Spider-Ham, a pig version of Spider-Man, which is really funny. <laughs> Marcella Ali voices Miles' uncle, Uncle Aaron, who I thought was really good in the movie, and Brian Terry Henry voices Miles' father, who is a police officer, and he was really good in the movie too. And then you have all these Spider-Man villains that show up in the movie, which are awesome, like you have the Green Goblin, and some other characters who I don't want to spoil. And all these characters were done so well. The animation is awesome. Lily Tomlin voices Aunt May in the film, which is really cool. And Zoe Kravitz voices Mary Jane, who I thought was very good in the movie. Everything about this movie was really, really good. I really did like this movie. Wilson Fisk was done very well in this film as the villain. Let's get into the negatives though, because this movie, as awesome and excellent as it is, it's not perfect. One of the main negatives is the design of the Kingpin. I, I wish they did the design of the Kingpin a little bit better. The Kingpin really doesn't look all that good, he, but he could have looked a little bit better. Like maybe use the, the design from one of the Spider-Man cartoons, like either Spectacular Spider-Man or the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, rather than making it look like he has no shoulders and no neck. But he did look pretty good for what the animation could do. And it's obvious that Sony wants to do movies based on these other Spider-Man characters, Spider-Gwen, Spider-Man Noir, and Spider-Ham. Eventually in the future, that's why they did this movie also. I'm all up for that. Definitely this is an excellent movie. Go check this movie out. I'm going to give this movie an A. Definitely see Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse.